would like to thank Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Argenix, Horizon Therapeutics, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Regeneron, and UCB for their generous support of this symposium. Our next presentation um, is about exercise and physical therapy, and it is my um, pleasure to uh, introduce with to you, Meredith Drake. Meredith Drake is a physical therapist with a, a board certified specialty in neurologic physical therapy. She received her clinical doctorate in physical therapy from the MGH Institute of Health Professions in Boston, Massachusetts, and completed a neurologic PT residency at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. She currently practices at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, specializing in outpatient management of neurologic disorders, diseases, and injuries. She is clinical fac faculty in the Johns Hopkins and University of Delaware Neurologic Physical Therapy Residency and guest lectures at Johns Hopkins University and the University of Maryland. She is passionate about helping people understand and take control of managing their long-term neurologic conditions. Meredith, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I will turn the time over to you and, and you have the full rest of, of the symposium. So you can take us all the way through to the end. Can you guys see my slides? Okay. Yep, you can just put them in presenter mode and you should be good. There you go. All right, so I'm going to be talking to you about um, exercise and rehab in myasthenia gravis. As she already said, I'm a neurologic physical therapist at Johns Hopkins. I live in Baltimore with my husband, our daughter, and our cat. Free cat photo for you guys. Um, my objectives for today is to help you better understand what the evidence is out there right now for exercise, not just strengthening and cardio, but also balance training and breathing exercises, um, the impact that fatigue and thermosensitivity can have on how well you can exercise, um, and then the role of rehab in helping you um, manage this and the importance of you really understanding what you can and cannot do and understanding your body's limits um, to make sure that you can optimize your own functional mobility. So everybody here knows what myasthenia gravis is, but the big takeaway is, is it's rare. Um, it causes weakness and fatigue, and it's something that worsens with activity. So more weak, there's more muscle weakness the more you use a muscle. Um, and it improves with rest because it allows available receptors for muscle activity um, to be freed up to then be used again. Clinical manifestations, again, everybody here is well aware of. Weakness of skeletal muscles, their eye, mouth, and throat um, muscles are often affected. There's muscle weakness, fatigue, breathing difficulty, eyelid drooping, double vision. Um, and again, all of this tends to come on a little bit worse with fatigue, which then raises the question, why exercise, right? If, if it's something that worsens with activity, then it seems counterintuitive to exercise and that has been kind of the common wisdom for a long time and there are still a lot of people in healthcare who feel that way who feel that um, exercise is unsafe um, and that people with myasthenia gravis shouldn't do it but and there have been and there there is of course valid concern because there's very few studies that have been done on exercise in myasthenia gravis so you kind of understand their hesitation um, but one thing that we know for sure across the board whether or not you have a neuromuscular disease or not, is that if you don't use it, you lose it. And everybody will get weaker and have more mobility issues if they don't challenge themselves to maintain their abilities. People with myasthenia gravis were found to be sedentary for 78% of their day. And this was not found to correlate with disease severity. So people with mild myasthenia gravis were just as sedentary as people with more severe cases. And when, without this kind of activity and without exercise, you see a decline in your physical capabilities um, and an increase in fatigue. It's almost like this, it feeds into itself. You know, you're you have increased fatigue, so you're less active, but because you're less active, you have more fatigue and it kind of snowballs. And then this further limits your ability to engage in meaningful activity. Um, 
And exercise is beneficial for your overall health, right? You don't just have myasthenia gravis, you have a heart that needs to stay strong, you have lungs that need to maintain function, you have bones that you want to prevent osteoporosis from forming. So there's other issues that happen whenever you become deconditioned, and we call those secondary impairments. So secondary impairments are from deconditioning, there's heart issues, lung issues, muscle and bone integrity issues, digestive issues, even urinary issues. Um, and of course, obviously, psychological issues, right? And aside from depression and anxiety being higher in, in people who are less active, there's also good evidence that whenever you're deconditioned, you're more likely to have confusion and disorientation. Um, so maintaining your activity level is really important. So what evidence is there? There's not a lot, admittedly. Um, there's there's a few few, extra, few studies on exercise in myasthenia gravis, and you have to factor in that myasthenia gravis is rare, right? So this leads to shortcomings in these studies, small sample sizes. Some studies just have six participants in them. Um, very few have more than you know ten to twenty. Um, and, so, and the small size affects how much we can really trust the reliability of some of their conclusions. And we also can't do subgroup analyses. So we can't say people with this type of myasthenia gravis tend to do better with this intervention versus that intervention. So we can't do any kind of subgroup analyses. Um, the other weakness of a lot of these studies is that they have a relatively short training win window. Um, and then very short follow-ups. So longer training windows, like longer studies and interventions have higher rates of dropouts. And when you're starting with only six subjects to begin with, it makes sense that they try to shoot for a shorter window to try to maximize how many people stay in the studies. Um, and then looking at long outcomes, in general, in exercise studies, it's it's a limited benefit, right? Because you have to maintain what you gained after an intervention. So if even in people that didn't have myasthenia gravis, if you had a long term follow up and you didn't actually see if they were maintained doing anything in the interim to try to maintain, of course, they would lose what they gained um, because that's just the way health and strength benefits of exercise work. You have to maintain them. Um, and then the last issue with a lot of the evidence out there is that there's not a lot of consistency between studies and what they did, how they did it, um, how they measured it. And so it makes it hard to compare the studies so we can try to get a little bit more reliability out of the data. So those are all the caveats to the evidence that's out there, but we are going to go into what is there and how and what do they say. There was a systematic review done a couple of years ago that found 11 studies that had been done on rehab and myasthenia gravis or rehab and exercise. And in general, they tend to tended to focus on three different approaches, physical training, so like strength training and aerobic conditioning, respiratory training, so breathing exercises, and then balance training. There's only one study that looked at balance, unfortunately. The conclusions that they found in the systematic review, though, was that all studies had positive outcomes. So the physical training had improvements in functional abilities and muscle force without any adverse events. The breathing exercises improved lung volumes and capacity, again, without any adverse events. And balance training reduced the risk of falls, again, without any adverse events. So very favorable in general. They also noted that in some of the studies, it was indicated that doing psychotherapy in condition in combination with the physical training could improve fatigue more than just doing exercise alone. Um, so addressing the emotional fatigue component of it all um, and that group therapy also seemed to really help with some of those emotional symptoms of social isolation and anxiety and depression. So it's something to think about when you're picking exercises to do that it might be good to sign up for group exercise classes, but just with people that you trust and are comfortable with so you can um, pace yourself appropriately as your body needs. And we'll get into that some more. There was another review um, that found similar findings. It's safe for people with 
um, with mild to moderate myasthenia gravis to exercise and that they could see improvements. So it's not just maintaining function, but it's actually improving what you have now. Um, all studies only looked at people with mild to moderate symptoms and everybody was stable and had well-controlled myasthenia gravis to participate in these studies. And that's a common thing in all neuromuscular literature. No one tends to really study people with more severe um, in more severe disease stages or more severe symptoms, it tends to only be studied in mild to moderate diseases. Um, but they found in this review that exercise can decrease your fatigue, increase your strength, and improve your functional mobility. Um, for the studies that did look at people with more severe symptoms, that they should focus more on lower intensity exercises and incorporate a lot of rest breaks, but that they still did see benefit. Um, and then also that you should optimize what you can do by timing your exercise with certain periods of the day when you have peak energy. So most people with myasthenia gravis tend to feel a little bit better in the morning, so they recommended working out in the morning. There was another review done in 2020 um, that said, reached the same conclusion that clinically stable people with myasthenia gravis should be able to still reap the benefits of physical exercise. And they suggested doing at least 150 minutes of exercise, moderate intensity a week. So 150 minutes total across the week. Um, and that's based on literature for like, the general population. It's not specific to myasthenia gravis. But they thought that was a good, safe starting point. Um, and then they also noted that there is a high quality randomized control trial being done. Um, the results are pending, but it's just kind of something that we're all waiting to see what their results are on exercise in myasthenia gravis. And then another review, one last review we'll go over. Um, again, reached the same conclusion uh, that the evidence that's out there is a little weak. You know, it's a few studies, there's selection bias, it's unblinded low numbers of subjects, so you have to take their results with a grain of salt, but the evidence across all the studies were overwhelmingly positive and in favor of doing exercise, but just highly individualized to you and how you are that day. Um, and they also suggested the 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise across the week. Um, they noted that there cannot be any specific recommendations for type of exercise or intensity of training because it's just so variable um, and between the, between people and between within one day, someone can be very variable. Um, so it just needs to be adapted to the individual patient and how you're feeling on that day. So the evidence for resistance training um, there's quite a few studies on this. Uh, unfortunately, none of them really went over how they found the starting resistance. Um, only one of them did. Normally in resistance training ex um, stu studies, they do a, a, a starting range based on a percent of your one rep max. So how much weight you can lift in one repetition. Um, and this wasn't used in any of these studies. One study did look at, um, they started their intervention at three sets of 12 repetitions based on your 15 rep maximum. And then they progressed it at week eight to doing three sets of eight at your eight rep max. And they made sure to rest for about two minutes between each set. Um, and that was the only exercise, that was the only exercise study that really specified exactly how they prescribed the resistance and the dosage of exercise and the pacing of it. Um, most resistance studies that I looked at did two sets of 10 repetitions, um, and then it sounds like it was just left up to the uh, clinician overseeing the exercise, what kind of resistance was determined. One thing that none of the studies noted if they did this, um, but I recommend doing to my patients whenever they're doing resistance training, in addition to resting, is alternate what body or part you're working on. So alternate arms and legs. That way you're getting an extra long rest for those muscle groups between exercises. Um, aerobic training, they, they actually, all studies that looked at aerobic training 
still achieved a target heart rate of about 80% of your heart rate max. And that's what a lot of the cardiovascular like, training literature does. So they, they still actually pushed it pretty hard in intensity, um, but they did interval training to help manage fatigue and overwork. So what most of them did was a two minute cycling at a high resistance and then dropping it down to no resistance. So you kept pedaling, but it was at a no to low resistance, letting the fatigue calm down for a couple minutes and then bumping it back up to 20 minutes, to, two, to um, high intensity for two minutes. And they were monitoring the heart rate and making sure that the intensity was still high enough to get you to 80% of your heart rate max in that two minute cycling period of intensity. Um, and uh, um, you can, there's online calculators for determining your heart rate max, but there's also a, a physical therapist can help you determine what that is. There was a study called the Restorex study um, that looked at people with mild to moderate myasthenia gravis, and they were randomized to either walking for 30 minutes a day or resting for 30 minutes a day. Um, and they got their usual treatment in addition to this. The walking protocol started them the first week they walked 10 minutes a day, the second week they walked 20 minutes a day, and then the third week they were watching, they're walking 30 minutes daily, which is a lot. Um, and they could you could split it up into two sessions if you needed to to help manage your fatigue. So you could do two 15-minute sessions throughout the day. And they had some really great results. They saw a 50% improvement on quality of life questionnaires. Um, they saw a 50% improvement on the distance traveled in a six minute walk. The six minute walk is an endurance measure where you just walk for six minutes and they measure how far you walk in that time frame. And they also were noted to be taking lower doses of medications. So it seemed like there was a lot of benefit to walking daily for these prolonged periods and getting that aerobic training in. So Exercise, it seems like, is really beneficial for people with myasthenia gravis. It's, you know, you have to approach it cautiously and you have to kind of progress yourself slowly and see what your body can handle. Um, but it seems like there's enough studies out there saying that it's beneficial, that it seems like it's definitely something that we should be encouraging people to do. But there are barriers to this. And so I'm going to go over some strategies to help you manage some of these barriers. A big barrier is thermosensitivity, um, where you're sensitive to heat. So people with myasthenia gravis um, tend to be very sensitive to getting too warm, and it makes it kind of exacerbates your symptoms. Um, higher temperatures can affect nerve signals and how they travel through the body. And when you have myasthenia gravis, you already have problems with that communication and with nerve signals. Um, so the heat added, adding heat to the equation makes that communication even more difficult. Um, and some people react to it quite strongly. Some people are very heat sensitive and some people are not. Um, so it just depends on you and your body, how much you need to worry about this. So this is a problem, right? Exercise is needed to prevent secondary impairments and to help you maintain your function for as long as possible. But exercise causes a rise in core temperature and core temperature slows conduction through your nerves. So it makes you feel worse. So how do you still get the exercise in that you need while not having an exacerbation of your symptoms? And a good way to do that is to manage your core temp. So there's some cooling strategies we're gonna go over one of which is using cooling garments. So in this picture, she's wearing a cooling vest um, and you can wear a cooling vest before an activity to pre-cool your core. Um, that way it takes longer for your core to reach that warm temperature that tends to limit your activity. And that way you can get a lot more activity in before you get to that point. So there's only one study that looked at wearing cooling vests in people with myasthenia gravis, and it was a small study, only six participants. Um, but they had, they looked at these outcome measures, the myasthenic muscle score, force vital capacity, et cetera, um, pre and post cooling with a cooling vest. And what they found was that the core temp was re significantly reduced within just 30 to 45 minutes of wearing the vest, and they found just wearing the vest improved your myasthenic muscle score 
and improve your max inspiratory pressure. So just wearing the vest helped improve your some of your um, functional abilities just by being cooler. Um, so they said cooling in patients with NG shows promise to decrease symptoms of weakness and fatigue, um, thus allowing increased muscle strength and endurance in some people. Of course, this is all with the caveat of this was a study of six patients, so they didn't want to make any bold claims or guarantees. So um, there's not much evidence for cooling in myasthenia gravis just because it hasn't been studied. Um, most literature is in MS, which is a neurologic condition that also has thermosensitivity due to nerve conduction issues, but the nerve condition conduction issues are completely different. Um, so you have to take this with a grain of salt. But there was a study that looked at pre-cooling in people with MS and they found that it improved their functional capacity, but they also found that pre-cooling for about 30 minutes to an hour lasted, the effects of it lasted people with MS for two to eight hours even. And so I find this helpful for some people to wear the vest in the morning before they get going, right? If you're gonna go to the gym in the morning or if you're gonna go on a hike with friends or you're gonna go play pickleball with friends, something like that. You can wear the vest beforehand to pre-cool yourself and know that you'll have a couple hours of being at your core temp at a lower temperature so you can push it a little bit and you can get more activity in before you need to stop and rest. Another strategy to try to stay cool is doing interval training. So interval training is alternating exercise with periods of rest. This, while you're resting, this is beneficial to people with myasthenia gravis for a few reasons, but one is you're letting your muscles rest, so again, you have more receptors available to reinitiate an activity, um, but then also it lets your core, core temp lower between each um, rep of interval training, so you can attain a greater volume of exercise by giving yourself some interval training. Nobody has really looked at interval training in myasthenia gravis, so again, I looked at the MS literature, so again, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but this was a very simple study that was done that looked at people with MS walking either six minutes continuously or doing two-minute intervals of walking. Same time of walking, right? They still walked for six minutes, but they did it in bouts, and they walked significantly further when they rested. Um, so they go, whenever they walk continuously, they didn't even walk a thousand feet. When they walked in intervals, they walked 128 feet further. So they actually got more activity in, more exercise in by allowing themselves to rest. And I think that's a really important takeaway. So if you do interval training, you will get more activity in. It will take you a little longer because you're stopping and resting, but stopping and resting allows you to get more in, get more practice in, get more repetition in, get more out of the exercise session that you're doing. And then in addition to that, it's letting you let your core temp reduce as well. Um, and the breaks can be active because I know a lot of people just aren't patient enough to let themselves truly rest, but you can find other things to do. Either breathing exercises are really important to do, so you could be active resting by doing a breathing exercise. You could do some stretching. Stretching is always really beneficial. Um, and so you can make it a little, you're still doing something, but you're letting your muscles rest and recover in those intervals. Some general lifestyle cooling strategies as well. Um, you know, opt for short showers with warm water instead of taking any hot baths. I know I have some patients who just love their hot bath and so they're just gonna do it. They just try to limit how often they do it or try to do it at the end of the day. Um, try to stay inside or uh, whenever it's really hot out or try to prioritize your activity that you want to do during the early morning or evening hours, whenever it's a little bit cooler out. And um, most importantly, if you feel hot, fatigued, or short of breath during an activity, 
stop and rest. That's your body telling you that you need to slow it down and it needs to recover for a little bit. So having the patience with yourself and your body and listening to it and taking that time to let yourself cool down and rest a little bit and recover. But then keep going afterwards, right? It doesn't mean you have to stop completely. It just means let your body rest a little bit and then do it again. So aquatic therapy, in theory, could be a great option for myasthenia gravis. There's no studies on aquatic therapy in myasthenia gravis that I could find. Um, but when you think about it, it works for a wide variety of functional levels. The buoyancy is supportive, so you can do get a lot more activity in um, before you have an onset of fatigue. And then pool accessories can either be supportive to help you stay in there for longer and exercise for longer, or can be resistive if you have a little bit more mild case and you want a little bit more of, um, resistance training to get in with it. However, the caveat is that most aquatic therapy pools follow the arthritis foundation recommendations, which means their temperature is about 83 to 90 degrees, which is a problem whenever you have thermosensitivity. The MS Society um, recommends working out in a pool that is less than 85 degrees, and that can be hard to find. Um, so what I tell people is before you, if you're interested in aquatic exercise, do it with a, um, a physical therapist first. I would do an aquatic therapy evaluation first just to see if you're safe in the water and if you're comfortable in the water. And when you do an aquatic therapy evaluation, before they put you in the pool, they actually do a land-based evaluation first. And I tell people to request to do the land-based evaluation next to the pool. That way you can see if you can tolerate the heat and the humidity of the pool or not. And that'll give you an idea if aquatic exercise is a good option for you, or if it's that that clinic isn't a good option for you. Um, but you may have to hunt a little bit to find one that isn't necessarily rated for arthritis, that it's rated for people with neuromuscular diseases, and that those can be a lot harder to find. Um, so, as I said, there was no studies done on uh, aquatic therapy in myasthenia gravis, but there have been studies done on neuromuscular diseases in general. And there was a review published recently that looked at many different types of neuromuscular diseases, including myasthenia gravis, and what evidence was out there for aquatic therapy and neuromuscular diseases. And they concluded that due to its low impact nature, um, that it could be ideal for people with weaker muscles. Um, that's a low risk intervention that allows you more movement opportunity without the risk of falling. But they did also caution that you have to think about the physiologic changes that happen when you enter water. Um, there are changes that happen to your cardiac and respiratory system, and it can increase your cardiac output and increase the work of breathing. So again, it can change your respiratory dynamics. And with myasthenia gravis, you have to be cautious about that. So that's, again, whenever I say do the land-based eval next to the water, see if you can tolerate the heat and the humidity of being near the pool. And then when you get into the pool, like just be ready to have to pull the plug if you start to feel bad, right? Always, always feel empowered to stop and pace yourself and say no if you need to. Um, but as I said, in theory, aquatic therapy could be something that's good for you. So general guidelines for dosage um, consider that higher intensity could be result in suboptimal training. So you'll fatigue before you can get the benefit of the exercise. Um, you'll get more out of your exercise if you pace yourself and give yourself breaks. You can get more reps in and more practice in. Um, and then also think about pre-cooling, wearing a cooling vest to see if you can get a little bit more out of your exercise if you're pre-cooled. So in general, how hard can I push it? This varies between person, between days, and between time of day, right? Sometimes people feel great in the morning and they feel awful in the afternoon. Sometimes you feel good whenever you have your medication peak and that can happen, you know, depending on the timing of the medication that may not follow that morning afternoon um, pattern. So it's, it's very variable. 
Uh, so you have to really kind of get to know yourself and your own body to figure out how hard you can push it. Um, for strength training, I tell people to consider trying higher sets and lower reps. So a lot of these studies just kind of did the cookie cutter two sets of 10. Um, but some people, in my experience, do better with some resistance, like they really love the feeling of resistance and like pumping iron. And so I'll tell them to try to do five sets of five with some resistance and they respond really well to that. So it's a lower rep, but higher sets. So they're still getting lots of practice. They're just getting more rest in between. Um, and then other people do better with just body weight and they can do three sets of 10 or two sets of 15. Um, so I tell people it just, it just depends on your body and what it seems like your body responds best to and know that that can change within the day for people with neuromuscular diseases. Um, for aerobic training, consider doing intervals, alternating two minutes on to one to two minutes off. But when you're on, really push it. It's It's been deemed safe. There's enough studies showing that it's safe to get your heart rate to 80% of the heart rate max. You can still get some cardio in. Just do some a short bout of it. Two minutes on, two minutes off. And then for other exercise and activity throughout your daily life, not just for specific exercises, but consider pacing yourself using this scale on the right here, the rating of perceived exertion scale. So in general, I recommend people stay in that four to six range, the moderate activity. So you're breathing heavily, but you can still have a conversation. So if you can't speak, if you can't finish your sentence, that means that you're working too hard. It's time to stop and rest. You want to still be able to talk and breathe at the same time. And that's a good place to kind of live. Um, is pushing yourself to that level. But again, in intervals, give yourself breaks as you need it. Alternative forms of exercise. It's not all just strength training and aerobic training. Balance is really important as well. Um, balance is a complex system. So it's formed by your vision, your ability to see where you are in space, your sensation, your ability to feel where you are in space, and the inner ear, which detects head rotation and acceleration, deceleration, and where you are against gravity. Um, so all these systems come together to create balance. You get all these sensory inputs and it, your body generates a motor output using that feedback from your body and what it's sensing in your environment. And it develops different balance strategies. So there's anticipatory, strategies where you know that something's about to, you know, you see that the sidewalk is broken and you need to be careful and you need to adjust your steps. There's reactive where, you know, somebody startles you and you have to catch your balance. Um, and then there's different ways that you can stay balanced. You know, some people use ankle strategies where they're wiggling in their feet. Some people use hip strategies and trunk strategies. So there's, it's a complex system that is, um, that happens whenever you try to stay balanced. And it's affected by fatigue. So nobody has looked at uh, balance measures and fatigue in myasthenia gravis. So I'm sorry I had to go to the MS literature again, um, but I feel like this is really relevant. So again, a simple study that looked at a Berg balance scale, which is an objective measure of balance. And for some people, they did it in a fatigued situation, or they did it in a fatigued and a non-fatigued situation. So the fatigued situation was they were doing the Berg balance scale in or interspersed with six minutes of walking. And then in the, uh, the non fatigue, they were doing the Berg balance scale with six minutes of resting interspersed. And what they found was this decrease in the Berg balance scale. So this indicates whenever you're fatigued objectively, you can measure that your balance is worse. And so you're more likely to fall whenever you're tired. Um, and so it's, Something to consider is being more cautious and whenever you're more fatigued um, and that you should be training your balance as well whenever you're feeling good, whenever you have high energy, but also whenever you're feeling fatigued because you need to be able to generate those balance reactions even whenever you're fatigued. And consider that balance, impaired balance can be secondary, right? So lack of practice, 
and fear avoidance can cause balance to decline. Um, so the impairments you see aren't always because of disease progression. It's just because you haven't, it's use it or lose it, right? Just like with strength and heart health, um, your balance is a system that needs to be maintained through exercise and exposure to different situations. Um, so someone with poor balance, it's, it's, Necessi isn't necessarily because a permanent thing because your your disease has worsened. It could be something that could be improved. So there's one study that looked at um, balance exercises in myasthenia gravis, and they had people do 16 sessions one to two times a week of workstation balance exercises. So they rotated through various exercises. So heel to toe walking, sit to stands, multi-directional walking, um, reaching to limits of stability, playing catch. Um, and they found significant improvements in balance and the reduced falls risk in people with myasthenia gravis. So it's, it's definitely worthwhile to do some balance exercises. You can do targeted balance exercises from a therapist, or you could do alternative forms of balance exercises. So I really like Tai Chi and yoga. They're fun. They're group exercise activities. So you're getting that social engagement, um, but they're low impact. They're low stress. They're meditative and they incorporate a lot of breathing. Um, so I think that they tend to be really good for people with myasthenia gravis. Um, and there's no evidence of using things like Tai Chi and yoga in MG specifically, but there is good evidence in uh, a lot of other neuro disorders like ataxia and MS and other types of diseases. These are, these have been found to be beneficial for balance um, in other populations. Another exercise that we talked about earlier that I said could be maybe one of your active rests between doing strength training or aerobic exercise can be breathing exercises. There have been lots of studies on breathing and, and respiratory training in myasthenia gravis, and um, they've been found to be really beneficial for improving your respiratory rate um, and uh, improving your functional abilities in terms of like your respiratory capacity. Um, most of these studies often include a training device, which you need the device to begin with, and then you also need training on how to use the device, um, normally like resistive breathing tools to help improve some of your lung strength. Um, but they also often include two different types of breathing strategies, which is diaphragmatic breathing, or, or also known as belly breathing. So it's where you're inhaling and your belly expands and pushes out. And on the exhale, it, it's your belly goes in. Um, and then purslip breathing, which is where you do a, a two count inhale and then a breath out for four counts with your lips pursed. So, And both of those breathing strategies have been found to be very beneficial for your respiratory capacity, and they're simple enough to do at home. Or again, to do as rest during your exercise. So general exercise recommendations. There's really nothing in the literature that says that you should do this exercise over that exercise. So I tend to tell people, pick something fun. Um, just don't overdo it. Right? Like think of that RPE scale, zero to 10, you want to live in a four to six range whenever you're doing an activity. You want to be able to breathe and talk normally at the same time while you're doing the activity. You want to time your medication to be at peak during the exercise session. You want to make sure that you're hydrated and listen to your body, right? Stop and rest whenever it needs to. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to say no whenever you feel like you're at your max and you need to stop and rest. Because remember, typically after rest, you can keep going. If you've been pacing yourself appropriately, if you've been staying in that four to six out of 10, you should be able to tolerate just a, sh a fairly brief rest, a couple minutes, and then be able to keep going. And then some general tips for maximizing your energy during the day. Um, plan some of the most energy demanding activities for when you're feeling best. So for most that's earlier in the day or time it around wherever your medication is at, their, at its peak. And then sit for some of the other daily tasks that can be surprisingly tiring. So prioritize your energy for when you wanna use it. 
get a tall stool so you can cook at the stove, um, sit to fold laundry, sit to brush your teeth even, but just conserving your energy and prioritizing it for certain times of the day. Um, and you can even select some rest friendly activities that are still enriching. So if your eyes are tired, um, but you like to read, don't push it with your eyes, give them the rest that they're telling you that they need and listen to an audiobook instead, right? You could still go on the adventure in the book. It's just going to be in a different way. And then some other things that you can do um, for my OT friends at work is, you know, if cooking is fatiguing, buy pre-chopped food from the frozen section. Um, or you could try some adaptive devices, like those fun little boggle cup things that chop up the food for you really quickly. Um, you can organize your kitchen so the most commonly used appliances are right there. You don't have to try to drag them out of storage. Just keep them out on your countertops if you know that they're the thing that you use the most, like toasters, or if you're one of the um, instant pot people. <laughs> I know there's just a lot of people who are very crazy about their instant pots. So keep those out, don't put them away. Um, so you're not wasting your energy getting them out. Um, you can, if your hand strength is starting to decline, you can get the button hook, as you can see in the photo there on the bottom. Um, you can ask your pharmacist to not give you the child proof pill bottles. Um, or you can use an automatic pill dispenser. Just make sure that you're keeping your medication out of reach of children and pets, of course. Um, and you can consider getting tools like grab bars near your toilet or an elevated toilet seat so you're not wasting energy on getting up and down from a low surface. So it's all about prioritizing your energy during the day. And then the last thing I was gonna to touch on is tips for working with your care team. And this was kind of brought up in the last discussion that I came in on. Um, when you have a condition like myasthenia gravis, I unfortunately, it's not common that you will find a provider who's very familiar with it, right? It's rare. It's common to us because you have myasthenia gravis or you treat myasthenia gravis. And this is kind of where we live. This is our lives. So to us, it's not rare. Um, and we think everybody should know about it, but the reality is, is most people haven't even heard of it. Um, and so in my, I, I consult at a clinic for the MDA um, where we take a lot of people who have rare neuromuscular disorders. And a lot of times the advice I give is, I know that it's frustrating, but you kind of have to accept that you are the expert on your disease and you are burdened with educating your providers about your disease. Um, so if you get referred to therapy for a sprained ankle, because that happens to everybody, right? Make sure that you call the clinic beforehand and they know that you have myasthenia gravis. And don't expect that this orthopedic therapist knows what myasthenia gravis is or what the precautions are. A good therapist will, of course, always look it up and try to inform themselves, but expect that you will probably have to educate them and then advocate for yourself as well and say, I need to stop and rest and show them how you pace yourself. Um, and then always make sure that you're communicating clearly with your care team, telling them what your goals are, what's most important to you in your life, so they can help you prioritize that. They can prioritize what they're doing and they can target their interventions to help you get to those specific tasks. That is it for my presentation. Any questions? I know we, I saw a few things popping up in the chat. Merida, thank you so much. Um, very informative presentation. Lots of things I hadn't thought of before. So thank you so much for sharing and being here with us. It does look like there's a few questions um, in. It looks like here's one. I have trouble sitting at a computer and doing work. Um, it's a trigger that makes symptoms worse. Is it the sitting or the exercising my eyes um, that's weakening? That's a great question. Um, I think you would have to just try to see which it feels like is more affected. Honestly, it's there's a good chance that it might be both. Um, and so that might be something where you need to, if sitting upright in a chair is too fatiguing for you, then you may need to pace it out and take some time to go lie down for a little bit. Again, you typically don't need to like truly rest for too long. It's normally just a couple minutes and then you can recover pretty quickly from that. If you're keeping yourself paced 
going into it. So if you're keeping yourself on that four to six range of a zero to 10 scale of fatigue, you should be able to do like short rests, recover and come back to a task. Um, you might also look into chairs that are a little bit more supportive so you can really lean back into them and have like a moment of rest um, and let your body kind of recover. And I would definitely look away from the screen and rest your eyes because screens are very fatiguing for everyone's eyes, honestly. Like, I mean, I, my eyes are miserable at the end of the day documenting on my laptop. So that's just a normal thing to experience and it's going to hit you harder than it would with um, my city gravis than it would other people. Makes sense. Um, another question in here, um, just sharing that it can be difficult for patients with myasthenia gravis to gauge how far to push themselves with exercise. Um, so, how can an MG patient and their physical therapist or their trainer figure out and help the patient to know the amount of exercise they should do um, to meet their exercise goals without overdoing it? So that's where you want to look at that RPE scale and try to stick to that four to six out of 10. That's like a good place to keep yourself. Like once you start getting to that point where you're breathing heavily, but you can still talk in sentences, but it starts to get hard to finish your sentence. That's whenever your body's telling you like it's getting to be too much. So stop and rest then. But again, with when you look at that cardio literature, I mean, they're pushing people to 80% of their heart rate max in two minutes, which is a lot. Um, and then they only rested for two minutes and before getting back into it, right? So it's it's safe to do these intervals and you typically don't need too long of a rest if you're keeping yourself within like a reasonable range of fatigue before you stop and rest. So if you're pushing yourself on that zero to 10 scale to an eight, nine, 10, it's going to take you the rest of the day to recover. So keeping yourself in that four to six range means shorter rest periods and recovery. Um, just uh, some observations here. Um, uh, audience member says that they're doing aquatic patient therapy. You can get in the pool and walk and exercise for 45 minutes, no problem. Um, out on land before and after um, this person has difficulty with a six minute walk. Um, it's a therapy pool, so it's a warm, warmed up pool. Um, so I don't know that there's a question, but just kind of any observations about that. Is it the water that's making it easier? Just the fact that it is water makes exercise a little easier. Yeah, the buoyancy of water makes it so you can do more activity while you're in the water. But then if it's a warm therapy pool, then that might make you feel more fatigued whenever you get out. So it might be something that you try cooling, right? Pre and post even, and see if you can bring your core temp down um, before getting in the pool and then bring it back down whenever you get out of the pool and see if that helps you feel a little bit better afterwards. Um, similarly, um, a uh, person typed in, um, they're on Medicare and doing aquatic PT at a local hospital. The hospital wants to, uh, discharge, uh, this person because they say that he's plateaued. Um, doctor says Medicare can impose no requirements on people with progressive diseases and I'm entitled to maintenance therapy. Um, so feels he's caught in the middle. Medicare won't pay for it. Doctor says he needs it. Yeah, this is kind of a tricky thing because maintenance therapy is new. So Medicare didn't used to pay for maintenance therapy and then there was a lawsuit a few years ago and now they do. Um, and so a lot of clinics are very nervous about where to, how to do this. You know, they're, they're nervous about um, Medicare, because Medicare doesn't deny until like a year later. Like we don't know that they're not paying until it's already done. Um, and so what typically happens whenever I convert people to a maintenance plan, because it is technically supposed to be covered, um, I they do make you sign what's called an ABN, which is an acknowledgement that you're saying that there is no longer um, potential for progression with therapy and it's acknowledging that you may if Medicare denies that you may get stuck with the bill, which is a scary thing for both the therapists and the patients to try to. Maneuver because there's a lot of costs involved in the long term for some of these neurologic diseases. Um, 
so far, knock on wood, it has been getting covered for me, but you know, it's the goals no longer become progression goals, they become maintenance goals. So I say they will demonstrate maintaining this current score of this outcome measure. They will continue, they will maintain walking this distance on the six minute walk. Um, and historically, so far, the way people are interpreting maintenance therapy is to be like touching base once a month or so. But I have had some patients that I've been seeing once a week. And so far, again, not on wood, um, it's been getting covered. Um, so it's, I think it's probably that the clinic is maybe not familiar with how to write up goals and justify maintenance therapy. Um, you should ask them to look into it and see if they'll be willing to look into it. Um, and then I would also sometimes what a lot of therapy, what a lot of clinics do is they do intervals of therapy, basically. So they'll instead of doing one long bout of maintenance therapy, they think that you might do better with touching base with them like twice a year. Um, so and that's something that I do quite frequently with a lot of people as well is I'll do like a month or two earlier in the year and then a month or two later in the year. And that way we're kind of spreading out their visits across the year. And then it's also giving the person the ability to kind of like not have to go to the hospital for therapy for a little bit and just get out and live their lives. Because I know that it's like, even though it's just an hour, a couple times a week, it is a burden and it is interrupting your life some. So some people are, like to do it that way as well. And I don't get a lot of grief from Medicare for doing it that way. So it could be worth bringing up to them, either doing a maintenance plan of doing like once a week or so, um, or trying to do these bouts of therapy where you come for a couple months, take a few months off, come for a couple months, take a few months off, and just see what you think might work best for you and the therapist. Great. Um, another question came in about the cooling vests. Um, where, where do you get those? That's a great question, actually. I don't know, Marissa, do you know if the MDA helps people get cooling vests? No, that's not something that we do. And it's so but our. I mean, it's not really been studied. Like I said, there's only been one study that looked at it. I know for people with MS, the MS Society helps them find a good place to get it. Um, but there's, there's, I mean, if you do a Google search, there's lots of cooling vests online. Um, they, they range from pricier because they're like slim and trim and hard to see under clothes um, to like the cheaper ones tend to be a little bit more bulky, but they're pretty easy to find online if you just Google cooling vest. Thank you so much, Meredith, for being here today. Um, we really appreciate your uh, expertise and your time to share with us. Um, so thank you very much. This was very informative.